Hi everyone, welcome to On the Other Hand. I'm Ariane Zersher and today I'm going to be doing a dorset button video for both hands, whether you're right-handed or left-handed. I'm going to be going over both. Now, I've done a couple of other dorset button videos in the past. I'm not going to take them down because being left-handed, I find I'm often having to figure out ways to do a stitch that are not like other left-handed people have shown, nor are they the direct opposite necessarily of what a right-handed person is doing. So I think the more methods one can learn and try and find which one works for you, the better. At least this has been my experience. So this is the way that I have found after making more than a hundred dorset buttons at this point, this is the way that I have found is the easiest and fastest for me. It may not be for you, but give it a shot and see what works. So don't forget to hit that like button. It helps me with the YouTube algorithms and all of that. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe. I love hearing from you. Leave me comments in the comments section and let's get to it. Grab a plastic ring and some thread and let's make a dorset button. I'm using, um, I'm using seagrass and I don't know what color this is. It's an old one. I don't even think CC has it on her. The thread gatherer has it on their site anymore. But um, for left-handed, and this is the, tr there are two tricky parts about the dorset ring. This beginning part, and then getting those spokes so they line up. This is what I do. I take my thread, and I take about, I don't know, this is like two yards, but I don't worry too much about it because I can always add thread. Uh, you know, it it's not a big deal. I take my, of my right hand, I take my index finger and my middle finger and I hold the thread like that. Then with my ring finger and my thumb of my right hand, my non-dominant hand, I'm going to sandwich that thread between the plastic ring and my thumb. Now I push this ring up a little so that I've got some room here. I take my thread and I'm going to put it under the plastic and under that thread. And I'm going to pull my needle through like this. And there's my first little ridge. And now I'm going to continue like this all the way around, holding on to that tail for at least, I don't know, six, seven wraps. And then I can cut off the excess and continue. Once I have this secured, this tail secured, and by the way, the tail is pointing to my dominant hand. It's pointing, for me, it's pointing left. I'm going to show you how to do this right-handed, but this is how you do it left-handed. So again, I just keep wrapping with my needle and thread, pulling through so that I'm getting that ridge on the top, which I can leave on the top or I can push it down if it's a traditional dorset button, you're going to push it down into the inside of the ring. I often leave it out. It depends on what I'm doing. I'm going to do just a couple more and then I'm going to clip my thread, my tail, and I'll show you how I do that so that it doesn't show. Once I've gotten this tail well adhered underneath all of these wraps, which it certainly is, I can go ahead and I'm going to pull it and then I'm going to clip it. 
and by pulling it and clipping, it's well underneath those wraps. And now I can just go ahead and wrap this whole ring. This ring is a big ring for such a small thread. It's about, I think they measure it from the interior, but the exterior is what, an inch and an eighth, something like that. But yeah, they are calling it an inch and an eighth. And that's what it is. Okay. So again, holding with my non-dominant hand, in my case it's my right hand, index and middle finger, holding the ring, plastic ring with my ring finger and thumb, pushing my needle and thread through, and it allows me to create that little ridge. I pull it pretty tight. I don't want it to be flopping around. I also want this ridge to be tightly uh, woven. If I if I leave it loose, it's going to be a little loopy, and I, I don't want that. Now, if I also know that I'm going to be doing, let's say, some bouillon knots or cast on bouillon knots around this outer edge, the way I did here, um, I might not make this quite so tight, but typically I make it pretty taut. Okay, I'm going to continue along here and wrap my whole ring and I will come back to show you those spokes when I'm done. Okay, so I've wrapped the entire thing and now I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to go right in to that first ridge right at the top. So I've made it a non-ending circle. Now I'm going to decide, do I want my ridge out or in? If I want it more traditional, I'm going to push it in. If I want to, I don't know, do something that would make me want to have the ridge not entirely in, I can leave it just on the back. And what I mean by that is Instead of pushing it all the way in, I just leave it sitting on the back like this so that it's neither on the outside nor is it on the inside. And that's an aesthetic choice. It also depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes if I'm making a tree, I'll leave it so that the ridge is neither in or out. It's just like this. Regardless, I'm now ready to wrap. Whether I wrap this way or this way, it actually doesn't make a difference. Either way, at least this is how I've found. It doesn't make a difference. So I think of it as a face of a clock. From 12 o'clock, I'm going to go to 6 o'clock, and I'm going to bisect that ring completely. I'm going to pull my thread up. By the way, if you're changing threads, this would be the time to change it. And then I'm going to the seven o'clock and one o'clock, eight o'clock and two o'clock, three o'clock and nine o'clock. And again, I want to bisect it. 10 o'clock and four o'clock. And I'm running out of thread. I'm actually not going to have enough thread. So I'm going to add a length and I'm going to continue. This is what it looks like, and here it is on the back. I'm not going to worry that this is a little bit funky. I can always push these with a needle so that they pair up better and go towards center. I've added my length in the back, and I'm going to do my one last wrap here for the 11 o'clock and five o'clock position. I'm not gonna worry that these are a little bit, they're not completely equidistant from each other. I'm gonna go ahead now and pair these spokes up. 
Okay, so this is my spoke here. I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, and six. That's where I'm going to come up with my needle. And now I'm going to count and I go down six spokes away. Now I'm going to count three in either direction. It doesn't matter what direction I go in. One, two, three. And now I'm going to count six from there. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. You can do six or seven, it doesn't really matter. But what you want to do is when you're looking at it from at the top, you want those pairs of threads lined up. Now you're going to go ahead and do your whipped woven circle all the way around, as I've shown in other videos. So there's my dorsal button. You can keep going. I ran out of thread, so I stopped, but you can keep going all the way so it's completely filled as I did with this one. You can change threads or this one, or you can stop and leave some space if you want. You can add things, but that's it. I'm going to show you now right-handed. I'm using this ring, which is a bit bigger. It's an inch and a half. Okay, so the same thing as I did with my left hand, but now using my right hand as my dominant hand, my tail is going to point towards my dominant hand, in this case, the right hand. With my left hand, I'm going to hold the thread between my index and my middle finger, and with my ring finger and my thumb, I'm going to hold that tail down. I'm going to take my thread in my right hand and I'm going to go underneath the thread and the ring and I'm going to pull this thread through so that I get that first little ridge. Now I'm using an oriental linen and I'm using an 18 chenille. With my seagrass, I used a 24 chenille. You can also use a tapestry needle, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to continue in this way, wrapping and securing that tail, which is under here, putting my needle under the plastic ring and the tail, and going through my thread, which is looping around. And that creates the ridge. I'm going to keep going for, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine wraps, something like that. Kind of depends on the weight of the thread as well. You can see I'm a little more awkward with my right hand, but a couple more times. If the thread twists on you, meaning it goes over the other threads, I just tweak them so that they're released and it is lining up nicely.
There we go. I'm going to clip this tail off by pulling on that tail, clipping, making sure I don't clip the thread that's wrapping around. And now I can continue on wrapping my ring just as I did before with my left hand. One of the things I wanted to mention as you wrap is that when you have your tail, and this is true for whether you are left-handed or right-handed, you need to have the ring up just enough so that you're able to go under your needle, under the ring and the tail with your needle. And then make sure that your needle, if you're left-handed, is going to the left. If you're right-handed, it's going to be going to the right. And the reason I say that is because you need it to go through this loop. If you don't, I'm going to show you what will happen. If you just go like this, right, instead of going this way through this loop, and you just do this, this is what happens. You just get a circle with no ridge, nothing. It's just so in order to get that ridge, you really have to make sure that you're going through the thread loop that you've created by holding with your non-dominant hand the thread and with your dominant hand pushing the needle and thread under that ring, under that tail, but through this and not over here. You want it to go here. The other thing I just want to mention quickly is that regardless of whether you are left-handed or right-handed, the spokes are going to be, the way you do your spokes will be the same. So I've demonstrated them with my left hand and it's the same whether you're left or right. Now when I do my spokes, I go from the 12 o'clock position to the one, to the two, to the three. If you're right-handed and you prefer going this way, then do that. But the idea, the concept is going to be exactly the same. So I'll just keep doing this. And I'll continue. Here is my wrapped ring in oriental linen. I haven't done spokes because I'm actually going to use this for my workshop in the advanced dorset button workshop and I'll make this, I'll, I'm going to do roots of a tree and a trunk and branches much the way I did with this one, this one, and then finally this one. So there's my aerial view of my my dorset buttons. This is my scissor case, which I've covered in dorset buttons. I just love it. I'm so happy with it. I added a few more for the background. And then I put a dorset button tab by sewing two back to back. So that's that. And then this is my case, which by the way, fits my rotary cutter. It also fits my pliers. And I've got a little uh, elastic thing here so I can close it with, of course, a dorset button. And this is one handed and my right hand, by the way. So there's the front. Is that just so cute? Come on, that's adorable. I love that. This is a class I'm going to be teaching. The Dorset Button Eyeglasses or and or Scissor Case. And we're going to go over all of this and it'll include the pattern. And then here are all my Dorset Buttons that I'm wrapping and getting ready for my Dorset Button 2 class, the Advanced, which we're doing We'll be covering trees, 
The first class we do is the, you know, just the basic how to wrap, how to get those spokes to line up and how to do that whipped woven for both left and right handed. And then in addition, how to add something around the edge. Um, but the second class is going to be the more abstract, these how to add t-shirting or other materials. This I wove roving inside and then stitched and, um, and, and this one, which is how we'll start the class. I hope this was helpful. Here's the thing about, about all of this. If you're left-handed, you tend, if you're like me, you tend to be a little bit ambidextrous just because we've had to be in a right-handed world. Um, so I really recommend trying both the way that I show in this video, which I find much, much easier and much faster. But if it isn't for you, try the other way that I show in the other Dorset Button videos. And I'm not going to take those down only because I do think that as left-handers, we tend to, we've kind of had to figure out what works best. And if you also use your right hand a lot, as I do for cutting scissors, you know, cutting with scissors, I always use my right hand. And other things, you may find that the other way is, is just as good or as well. So don't forget to give me a thumbs up. That always helps me out with the YouTube algorithms and all of that. And subscribe if you haven't already. And until we meet again, let's keep stitching together.